Okay, hello, and um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. You may have been expecting someone else to be the keynote speaker here, um, but unfortunately, he's had some difficulties, so unfortunately, you're getting me instead to talk about complex agent-based modeling and informality in sub-Saharan Africa and all of that excellent stuff. Um, so yes, my PhD is titled Agent-Based Modeling of Electricity Access in Informal Settlements in South Africa. Um, I'm afraid I didn't change the date from the seminar series yesterday where I also presented this, so my apologies for that. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some context and some introduction, as well as what agent-based methods are. Uh, I'm going to discuss my process of constructing an agent-based model of informal settlement electrification. Um, I'll be looking at some of the modeling process and the scenarios that I interrogated as part of the model. Uh, we'll be looking through some results and a brief bit of discussion and conclusion of these interim results and then I'll be finishing off with some discussion of my current work and some future work of looking to finish up the uh, PhD research. Um, so to introduce some context, um, the ADB, the African Development Bank in 2011, suggested that 50% uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa, well, I think that's Africa in general actually, that statistic, uh, would be urbanized by 2030. And uh, more recently, uh, in 2018, the United Nations said that uh, Sub-Saharan African countries are going to be experiencing a 3% urban population growth year on year through to 2050. So this uh, puts an immense strain on municipal government's ability to provide urban services to growing populations. Um, and the growth in informality, both in terms of informal habitation via informal settlements and in informal services access, so urban services, which is illegal electricity connections, but this also covers things like water and sanitation. Um, uh, ha has seen, ha has produced a massive amount of growth over the last, uh, over recent decades. Um, and I seek to position this research within uh, two main sustainable development goals. This is SDG 7 and 11. I'm very much an SDG 11 researcher uh, in my career. So um, making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. I think resilient and inclusive are quite important there, but the sustainable one is what tends to get the focus. Um, and access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. I think modern is doing quite a lot of work in that sentence, which we could have a further discussion on. <clears throat> um, so, let me just give a focus back. Um, Informal settlements can be defined in many ways. I've, uh, I've taken an aerial picture from Google Maps of the Kennedy Road informal settlement, which was one of my initial case studies during the course of this PhD. And as you can see, it's, it's a very dense development. So it's a high population density and a high dwelling density, uh, and is developed in an unplanned manner. Um, often there's a lack of standardized construction materials in informal settlements, which can lead to some regulatory barriers later on in terms of accessing services, which I'll go over. Um, and one of the critical things is a lack of land tenure. Informal settlements are often cited on either land that isn't proclaimed for residential use by the municipality or land that is already owned by a third party. For example, uh, I've seen some case studies recently where informal settlements are cited on land that is uh, slated for agricultural use but has been uh, developed for residential use by informal settlement residents. And this leads to some challenges in accessing urban services. So what I mean by urban services are water, sanitation, things like emergency services, but critically for this project, electricity. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about ABM, and I haven't actually included a, a slide on what agent-based methods really are and agent-based modeling really is. So agent-based modeling is a methodology where you have multiple heterogeneous agents who interact with each other and with the space in the model, as well as other types of agents, so whether that be institutional agents or even agents on a geographical basis, can be the, the geography of a settlement could be modeled as an agent. Um, uh, they interact with each other and produce what's known as emergent behavior. Ideally, um, it, often things can be a little deterministic, um, but uh, ideally agent-based methods enable us to uh, examine these complex systems with multiple actors, with multiple priorities, and try and see how they interact as a whole system. Uh, for this model specifically, uh, I set myself three research questions. Uh, the economic challenges at a household level to universal electrification of informal settlements on a formal basis in South Africa. Um, looking at the impact of the income status of a household in accessing formal or illegal electricity connections. Uh, and what kind of economic policies or economic programs would increase access to reliable formal electricity. Um, I, I'm putting reliable and formal electricity in this quite often because in some ways we could define illegal electricity connections as electricity access, could we not? So uh, I, I think when we're talking about access we need to look at whether we are looking at access for access' sake or if we're looking at access on a formal legal basis. Um, illegal electricity connections obviously have 
a number of challenges associated with them, being things like the risk of fires and the risk of electrocution and so on and so forth. But if electricity services are electricity services, then should we not just regularize? Which is a question I'll be getting to later in the PhD. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about my modeling process here. I'm, I'm using a software package called NetLogo, which is in many ways the kind of industry standard for uh, agent-based modeling. Um, you can use other methods such as Python and other things, but um, I chose to use NetLogo. Uh, the simulation itself here is run for 1140 ticks, that's time steps. Um, that's three 360-day years plus 60 extra ticks for some pattern establishment at the beginning. Um, the advantages of NetLogo is allowing for some real-time data graphing, uh, as well as some visual representations of the model for some visual debugging, uh, and the software itself allows for a rapid adjustment of parameters. You see this massive bevy of sliders I have at the top of this model. Um, they can be varied for various uh, options within the model setup. Uh, I won't spend too long on these next two slides because uh, it's quite dense. It's a lot of the parameters that I wanted to set out. Um, you have some booleans, you have electricity and informal electricity, which are true false. Uh, the one I wanted to speak about on this slide is risk. Um, risk is one of the interesting components of this model. It's uh, used as a proxy for the failure modes associated with illegal electricity connections, <coughs> such as brownouts and fires and so on. Um, risk is used as a proxy for agents' willingness to endure these failures. Um, and so if risk is too low, then agents will not pursue an illegal electricity connection. If risk is high, then they will. Um, and a few other variables there. Uh, I'll be circulating these slides later if anyone wants to have a look at um, some of these variables in more detail. Um, a few of the global variables, variables here, these are what are used in the model setup. Um, things like the new formal cost, which is a new cost, uh, which is the formal electricity connections, uh, the cost associated with the new formal electricity connection, uh, as well as the cost associated with the legal electricity connection, reconnection costs, um, and the cost per kilowatt hour, and a few other things like that. Um, uh, I'd also like to just quickly go over the quintile X, quintile 1, 2, 3, 4 in this. I, I'm saying quintile because quintile 5 is kind of discarded in this analysis because there's not many quintile 5 residents in informal settlements. Um, but there's an even spread from quintiles 1 to 4 according to the Hazard Development Agency in South Africa 2012 as well as Statistics South Africa 2016, which is one of the interesting features of this research that I've found so far. Um, normally, when we're looking at informal settlements, you expect it to be quite a poverty context, but there are people with some capital in, in these contexts according to Statistics South Africa, which is quite interesting to me. Um, so obviously, with any modeling process, you need to make some assumptions. And the assumptions that I made for this are a 100% reliable electricity grid. Anyone who knows anything about the South African electricity network will have a big red flag at this point. But for the purposes of this model, I assumed a 100% reliable grid. Um, uh, I'm also assuming that agents have a stable monthly income, and that informal settlements contain a mix of formal and illegal electricity connections as well as there being some presence of illegal electricity reselling within a settlement. That is uh, an agent with a formal electricity connection who is then selling electricity on a third party basis onto others around them. Um, and from these assumptions and from this model, I've uh, constructed some scenarios to analyze. Being a business as usual scenario, which is based on some real world economic data. Um, the data is a little old, it's 2015-2016 uh, time, but it still gives us some indications. Um, uh, a low illegal reseller reach scenario. Um, in the model, illegal electricity resellers have a sort of radius of operation that they can then connect others who are unconnected around them in. The low reseller reach scenario reduces this kind of uh, sphere of influence. Uh, and also a formal cost subsidy scenario, which is what I was talking about when I was discussing economic policy earlier. <coughs> um, the formal cost subsidy scenario reduces the cost associated with a new formal electricity connection within the scenarios, or within the, uh, within the model. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, moving on to some results. Um, these graphs are a little bit complicated, but I'll try and go through them. Um, in a business as usual scenario, we can see that formal electricity access, that's this top one here, um, formal electricity access is pretty much solely confined to quintile 4 agents, the richest in the simulation, with some Q3 agents late in the simulation run. Um, quintile 3 residents are dominant in illegal access, whereas quintile 1 and 2 residents struggle to maintain even an illegal electricity connection on a purely economic basis. Um, and as we can see from the baseline scenario graph in total, there's a sort of inverse relationship between no access and illegal access, which suggests that if illegal electricity is available, then people will move to it preferentially over formal electricity. Um, 
there's little movement towards formal except late in the simulation run when there's some capital is built up for some agents in the system. Uh, for the low reseller reach scenario, uh, formal electricity access is higher, uh, which is quite obvious due to the lower availability of illegal access. Uh, Quintile 4 residents continue to dominate formal access, but Quintile 3 residents begin accessing formal earlier in the simulation and in greater numbers, which is interesting. Um, Quintile 2 residents have some formal access, we can see by the blue line uh, just at the bottom of this top graph here. Uh, at the end of this top graph here, the blue line there, uh, Quintile 2 residents begin accessing formal if available, um, which suggests that there is an affordability gap still, but there is some degree of affordability for Quintile 2 residents in accessing formal electricity. The interesting part is Quintile 1 residents are still unable to afford formal electricity, e even if it's the only game in town. So that's, um, that, that, that suggests that there is still this, this uh, gap in affordability for formal electricity connections on an economic basis. Um, looking at the formal cost subsidy, um, Quintile 1 and 2 residents' behaviour is quite similar to the baseline scenario. So does this suggest that the new connection cost is not an issue, or is it just that the subsidy amount that was coded into the model is too small? Um, that's something that I'm looking at analysing uh, as I come to finish up this process. Um, formal access for Quintile 3 residents is kind of time shifted earlier in the simulation, which suggests that it's a similar sort of peak, uh, but it occurs earlier in the simulation run which suggests that affordability is higher and requires less sort of capital accrual over the course of the simulation for Quintile 3 residents to access formal electricity. Um, what we see here is higher total illegal access rates, which is quite interesting. Uh, residents are still moving from illegal to no access, uh, which we see from the inverse yellow and blue lines over there. Um, but formal access rates are remaining more steady. Um, so what does this all mean? Based on real-world economic data, we can see that Quintile 1 and 2 residents will still struggle to access formal electricity connections, even, uh, uh, and would also still, ac still struggle to access illegal electricity connections, even on a less costly illegal basis. Um, the low reseller reach scenario suggests that there is some affordability for Quintile 2 residents, but there's still an affordability gap for Quintile 1 residents. Uh, and Quintile 3 residents show there's a high uptake of formal electricity if illegal access is not available, but predominantly illegal access still dominates for those residents. Now I want to talk a little bit about my current work and my future work, because if you're paying attention through this uh, presentation, you may think, couldn't this model just be a spreadsheet, Dan? Uh, and in some ways you are right, aside from the fact that there is a small amount of spatial dimensions. However, this model is not taking advantage of the full degree of uh, power, as it were, that agent-based modeling is capable of. So I went back to the drawing board and I conducted a little bit of primary research. I've conducted two key informant interviews, one with a municipal electricity department head in eastern South Africa and one with a uh, informal settlement upgrading program facilitator and coordinator from an NGO. Um, uh, and I've gone through a couple of hours of interview with each of these people and written them up and um, we're, I'm looking to take forward some of those ideas and concepts through to a final model. Um, some experimental uh, information from the final model on this side, we have uh, network agents in the center there connecting some households around them and then the network agent spreads the network around and this is a little messy at the moment because I haven't really sorted out the visuals for it, um, but we have a network agent putting in new network connection points which are then connecting the blue households which is formal electricity access. However, over time, hook on illegal connections will occur in this simulation which is the yellow households. So um, I'm looking specifically at one aspect of illegality. There are a few different modes of illegal electricity access in South Africa, from self-connection through to meter bypass, through to um, forged prepaid credit cards and a few other things like this. Um, but I'm specifically looking at hook-on illegal connections, which is uh, people self-connecting to a formal electricity access point in this model. Um, I think spatial relationships in that regard to infrastructure are going to be a key factor. But I also want to look at some of the administrative barriers, some of the regulatory barriers, and in particular some of the political economy barriers. Um, energy is a political tool, as we are seeing in the West in a large way at the moment, but it's been a political tool for decades. And um, I think trying to capture some of the complexity in political relationships between community groups and government, as well as municipalities and national governments, would help to capture some of the diverse opinions in this space. Um, agent agent and agent space interaction is critical because that will enable me to take full advantage of agent based modeling as a methodology. Um, 
And I just want to finish up with a note on complex adaptive systems. Um, informal settlements exhibit many of the traits of complex adaptive systems, and really ABM is one of the best tools for analyzing these systems of multiple actors, each with their own personalities, each with their own drivers, each with their own constraints. So um, how to capture this complexity in future is uh, going to be something that I'm finishing up my PhD and um, writing up about. So um, I want to say thanks very much for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure to come and speak to you, and uh, any questions, welcome. You do have any question? Oh, John. I've got a question, Dan. Um, I don't know a lot about Asian based modeling, as you clearly know. Uh, however, I'm doing persona modeling as a backdrop to my research. So there's a question whether or not this sort of thing, once I've got some data created and the information collated and create my personas from my 300 odd different you know, research subjects, does agent-based modeling provide some methodological benefit to understand how they would play out in different role-playing scenarios that could be a benefit in my case to look at once I've created this persona modeling sort of layout? Yeah, I think one of the thanks, John. That's an interesting question. Um, I think one of the things about agent-based modeling that is uh, kind of beautiful about it is that it's not just a quantitative methodology. In fact, in many ways, it's not a quantitative methodology at all, despite all my graphs. <laughs> um, so uh, you can apply it to a number of different social phenomena. Um, one of the very famous agent-based models is. Um, modeling uh, bar attendance at a particular popular bar in San Diego, for example. Um, and so you have people, uh, you know, they'll have a social network within the agent-based model. Um, so I think persona modeling uh, as a thing could be an interesting input into creating a set of parameters for agents within an agent-based model. Um, and then you could have these various personas interact and possibly change over the course of the model. Um, so you can model social influence in that way, which would be kind of an interesting application, I think. Energy so, policy. Yeah, energy policy, for example. Policy implications based on personae, very interesting. So um, uh, I think yes, and I think it would be an interesting challenge. Thank you. Uh, yeah, anyone else? <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, I'm interested very really, uh, uh, well done uh, about your work, but uh, my question, why you chose just South Africa? I think this is a global problem. It is indeed a global problem, yeah. yeah. So um, the reason I chose South Africa, sorry, um, do you want to finish? <laughs> Uh, the reason I chose South Africa uh, is partly because that's where most of my research experience is, and so it's the context that I know best. Um, before I started this PhD, I was on a couple of EPSRC, uh, DFID, DECC, if anyone remembers the DECC, <laughs> um, uh, funded projects at UCL, and they were looking at sustainable urbanization in South Africa specifically. But we also worked with, um, with Ghana and Uganda and some municipalities in those two countries as well over the course of those projects. Um, I chose South Africa because I think it's an interesting context. Uh, and also because South Africa has been quite uh, proactive in terms of uh, generating new methodologies and new models and new programs to try and service informal settlement populations uh, with electricity, with water and so on. Um, free basic electricity allowance and RDA housing and a few other things like that are some examples of this. Um, so South Africa is quite a forward thinking context in some ways, but there's still a lot of barriers. Um, something I'd be interested in post PhD uh, is a kind of new comparative analysis because uh, as we know from Brazilian favelas and um, you know, Philippine informal settlements and the giant slums along the river in Mumbai, then this is a global issue. Uh, and municipalities globally need to, particularly in developing countries, need to address these, um, these challenges of people demanding the services and rights of the city, but the municipality not being able to keep up with demand. So yeah, that, that's, that's my reasoning for picking South Africa, but absolutely this needs to be looked at on a, on a much more global basis. Is there any question? Okay, thank you for Daniel. I mean, it's really interesting topic. And also, good luck for this research. Yeah. I mean, in December. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> All right.